All right, I think uh, we're going to get started. So everybody's just getting back from their lunch break. Yeah, that's part of the issue. So what are we going to do? Have you um, do jumping jacks or something so you don't fall asleep right now? <laughs> All right, um, we're actually really excited to be here today. Um, we're from Allianz Germany. Um, this is Ludwig Paulsen. He's a project manager, product owner for uh, our cloud ops team. And uh, I'm the head of department uh, for that same team. And uh, what we want to do is talk to you a little bit about what um, our experience has been um, just making you know, embarking on this journey in, into these new technologies. And um, I wanted to also say that, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of deep technical conversations um, throughout the last couple of days. And one of the things that we have found, though, is that it's not just about the technology. We'll talk a little bit about the technology, but it was important to us to also talk about all those other puzzle pieces um, that it takes to make the digital transformation for an organization successful. So who runs the cloud? Who runs the cloud at Allianz Germany is CloudOps. Um, that's the team. And yeah, this is our logo. And um, the, the team um, is who made the journey possible. The team started as a very small team. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit more about what that experience was like. But first, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about our company. The Allianz Group is a, is a large insurance company. Uh, we have about 88 million uh, customers worldwide, 140,000 employees. And um, we are in about 70 countries around the world. And um, one of the challenges that we have, I mean, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. We're 127 years old uh, this year. So the bad thing is that, that what that means, as most of you can probably imagine, is that we have um, lots of IT debt, many, many legacy systems. Um, but the good news is that um, we've always been at the forefront of innovation. Um, we made a choice back in the day to um, be one of the uh, insurance companies with the Titanic project. Didn't turn out so great. Um, but we're hoping we're more successful with these new endeavors, you know, with um, providing drone insurance um, and other exciting things. So to talk to you about uh, the, the journey that we started a couple of years ago um, and, and how that came about, we uh, had uh, some of our executives um, visit um, a bunch of different companies at Silicon Valley. And um, one of those companies was uh, Pivotal. And they came back, and what they said was, that's what we have to do. We want that. You guys have to make it happen. So, so that's. Again, a good thing. We had senior management uh, buy-in. They were all excited about the uh, possibilities that would come with that. And um, so we started, you know. And uh, it was in 2016. We had, um, by March, our first uh, PWS install. We went with uh, PWS because it was the fastest thing we could do but realized by, by the time August came around um, that we really needed to do uh, a little bit more and, and actually set up our first cluster on-prem, on-prem because we had always done it on-prem, right? Um, and then by the end of the year, however, um, had to really um, look at um, scalability of, uh, of our uh, environment and moved into a, a multi cluster cloud environment. In parallel, so while all this technology stuff was going on, uh, we also set up training centers to get our developers um, developing in more agile ways. We had sent uh, a couple of teams to Pivotal Labs in London 
uh, where they learned how to pair program and, uh, and also to use uh, the technology. And then by the time they came back, we had to have our platform as a service, our cloud, um, not, not cloud yet, but our platform as a service ready so that they could actually uh, begin to develop. Again, um, we realized that that really didn't scale enough if we were going to be serious about digital transformation. And uh, so by the end of that first year, uh, we sat down and, and talked about different options. And um, just this incredible thing happened. As an insurance company, we always said we were never going to use the cloud, right? And by the end of that year, uh, we made a decision. We looked at all the options and, um, and were able to decide to move into, into the cloud. So we don't have data in the cloud. Um, we still today do not have any data that we store in the cloud. But we were able to um, move our front end uh, systems in, into the Amazon cloud. But how did we do that? We learned from, from that first year project where we had set everything up uh, on-prem and um, had run into just a, um, a few uh, issues, especially toward the end of the project where um, you know, security folks came up and uh, told us about all the things we couldn't do. Um, so that delayed us quite a bit. And uh, so that when we decided uh, to move into the cloud, uh, what we decided to do was to actually have cross-functional team, um, a, a, a truly cross-functional team with um, someone from, from our architecture team, but also from the security side of the house actively participating in the project um, and, uh, and creating the solution together with us rather than you know, having, having them be the, the showstopper with the stop sign um, at the end. And that worked really well for us, I have to say. So um, what we did was um, we had those, um, the new environment set up within five months. At the end of that second year, we were in the cloud with 600 hosts, 11 container platforms, 3.5 terabyte of uh, memory, and about 500 users using that platform. And out of that, we had five apps in production and about 100 in, in our development space. And now, a few months later, do you know how many, how many we have? Um, we have about 100 applications now. So um, Cloud Foundry alone is 600 application instances, about, a, about 100 applications. So for... Oh, sorry, yeah, my mic is not on. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me now? OK, perfect. So um, Cloud Foundry alone is about uh, 600 um, application instances in prod, about uh, 2,000 in dev, and it's, um, from the business point of view, about 100 applications. So when you think about it, you know, for, for a large um, historical insurance company, that was really a huge thing to, to not only move into this new technology so quickly, but to also be leveraging uh, cloud technology, um, trying to get this tanker uh, moving and uh, making the organization more agile really many times felt like we were trying to make the impossible possible, but we succeeded. So that's kind of the, the framework, um, but then um, I, I'd like to talk to you also a little bit about the people factor. Um, and, um, and really what it meant and, and what, what the major challenges were that we encountered uh, in that space. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, it's really um, a paradigm shift uh, within our organization that we're facing because we need just a different mindset. Uh, we need people who um, are willing to try new things, who especially in an insurance company, we don't, we don't like taking risk, right? And so uh, to try new things, to, to make mistakes, to learn from those mistakes, those were some of the major challenges, and I'll get into a little bit more detail uh, just um, in a couple of slides from now. So with all of this new stuff and this digital transformation, 
you know, it, it felt a little bit like it, it might have felt um, for the Beatles when not everybody was on board. Not, not everybody believed that this was really going to be, um, you know, an exciting, successful thing. So as it comes to people, um, our experience was that it, it really is a mindset uh, thing, you know. It takes a new way of thinking, whereas in the past, you know, people were told what to do, how to do it. Um, and now um, it was really more about every single person taking responsibility. And for us to begin to define the framework and the, and the sort of the, the boundaries within which um, they could actually do that and, and do that safely. Um, and so what we did was we created, um, we ran a bunch of uh, workshops where we defined roles and responsibilities, um, where we talked about um, our mission, what, um, you know, what you saw in that um, second slide, uh, not just the new uh, team name, but also um, a logo and a mission that went with it um, so that they could identify themselves with it. And we actually went from eight internal employees who had been running our um, portal environment to 21 cloud ops team members. We took all of the strategic um, initiatives that had been in the hands of external um, consultants and service providers, and they are now all run within that team of 21 folks. So that also means we have some legacy, um, some legacy responsibilities that they still have to cover, um, but they are mostly now focused on um, running this platform as a service and continuing to evolve it and automate it and improve it. And it, it's also about a new way of, of working, of course. So we had to, in the past, we ran long projects, you know, never-ending projects that by the, by the time we're finally done, who knows what was at the end of it, if it was what we really needed or what the customer needed. Um, and now we have the, the team set up in different uh, clusters. Um, so for the different uh, platform topics, it's... Um, um, we, have a, we have a cluster that is um, solely focused on all of our legacy core components, and we have a product owner that is in charge of, of running that. And then um, we also have the new, um, the new cloud team um, divided up into three clusters, the monitoring cluster, the runtime cluster, and, um, and then also um, the integration layer. So within those four different smaller teams, they are now focused on um, their respective areas of responsibility, and um, the product owner uh, makes sure that all of the important um, things that need to be handled are put into the backlog and, um, and prioritized accordingly, and the team then, all of the engineers help, uh, of course, work through that backlog. And uh, of course, we need a new way of leadership, right? Um, it's, it's no longer, it doesn't work anymore to have somebody there who, who has to know everything. The world has become way too complex um, to, to try and have one person tell the entire team what and how to do things. So it's certainly more of a servant um, type leadership where the, where the whole um, power uh, pyramid uh, is turned upside down, and uh, it's now about really, truly enabling and empowering the team and um, taking the roadblocks out of the way and, and just letting them do things. And it's really, truly amazing. I mean, I've watched these guys um, put this environment together. Yeah, we had um, a lot of external ex expertise that we brought in at the very beginning, but um, the, the team members both the internal as well as the external uh, folks worked together so well and created this incredible platform for us and continue to improve and evolve it. Um, it's, it's been just incredible to, to watch them do that and, and have fun with it, you know. So one of the really important pieces, as I mentioned before, is to, to make sure, especially when you have a culture, which I think most companies do, where you know, it's, it's not really cool to make mistakes, 
to um, to make sure there's no blaming um, that we um, we take those mistakes and we make sure we learn from them. And um, we also um, have found that we have had to break down the silos. You know, it's um, it doesn't work anymore to have the ops folks and the and the dev folks and the architects and the security people all just work in their own little. Uh, in their own little world, but um, it's just been tremendously helpful um, to have them interact on a regular basis. And um, one of the things actually that we've learned, one of our mistakes, was that in the beginning we were so busy setting up this platform um, while the training centers were getting staffed and, um, and teams started developing new apps that we did not interact with them enough so um, a lot of the stuff that could have been avoided, um, you know, things that they had to redo because they didn't know how to do it properly, um, could have been avoided if we had had more of a present from the beginning and were actually part of those teams or, or at least circling through those teams, having a present in those training centers. But we just couldn't do it all at the same time, you know. So that was definitely a, a big lesson learned. And, um, and, and the other uh, lesson certainly was to try and figure out how to deal with legacy team on, on one side and the new team moving into the new technology on the other side. And initially, the thought was to create two different teams. Bless you. But then we realized, you know, if we create two different teams, it's going to be impossible for those folks who are um, today in charge of the legacy stuff, for them to move into the new world at some point and to actually help move the legacy world into the new world and for everybody to begin to get an end-to-end -end understanding of the complexity of our environment. So we, we decided to create one really large team which you could argue that's not really the two pizza team that Amazon always talks about, right? But for, for this first phase, um, we decided to just cluster the way I mentioned earlier and have them focus on, on their respective areas of responsibility, um, but to keep them as one team so that they could um, interact more and, and take along you know, the, the legacy folks for the ride. And, um, you know, initially we also thought that we'd define this one time and then we know how to do it and then we just go and, and that's the end of that, right? But we realized as, as things changed and evolved and the environment grew, um, we had to adjust things and create those clusters and, uh, and create the different roles and have the product owners um, in charge of the of the various topics and define the roles of the of the platform engineer and uh, and define what it actually meant now uh, to be a platform engineer and how the product owners would then work together and um, exchange um, their priorities so that they all knew what what each other were working on. So it's an evolving it's been an evolving process for us and not necessarily you know. You, you define it once and, and you're done. That was certainly a lesson learned. Um, and one of the things that we've just recently said was that um, not having, having moved from the project team now to more of a product team type setup, um, we realized that now that the project is closed, we don't have enough of a security presence anymore. So we were just doing a couple of things the other day. We, um, as part of a dojo, with Pivotal um, that we implemented and um, didn't realize we probably should have should have asked security uh, for sign off, um, and we just hadn't thought about it, you know. And uh, and the problem with security folks is that they are so um, needed and wanted everywhere that they are not reachable, they're, they're not around enough um, and timely enough. Uh, so one of the things we've decided to do is to create a, um, you know, a, a specific security focus within our team and have um, one or two folks really focus on that and, um, and represent that security function within, within the team.
So yeah, and th this is the team. Um, you can see on the slide here, you know, some of what I already mentioned that we moved from um, project uh, manager to these new roles of um, product owner, platform engineer, and so forth. And um, and that's actually been been working really well. And here is the, here are the clusters again that I mentioned earlier, uh, with the different products that are associated with that. And you can see the monitoring cluster spans both worlds. The, on the left, the legacy world, and on the right, the the new world. Um, so that's our way of really beginning to pull all of that legacy knowledge um, into into the new world. So for now, they're focused on their clusters, um, but midterm um, goal is to get everybody to understand, at least at a, at a superficial level, the entire platform as a service. Thank you. So, um, can you hear me? That's all right. Okay. So I really have to hurry a little now, um, as we all um, have, no worries, 20 minutes already passed, but I think it's, it's okay because, um, in our opinion, people is um, obviously the most important part of, of this transformation um, undertaking. So I'm um, coming to processes. Um, we decided to uh, move from project management to product management, and what we, um, what we mean by that, or what we mean by treating a platform as a product, is um, that you that you handle it uh, differently. So when we implemented the cloud platform in 2016, we followed, um, or we obviously undertook a huge project, what uh, was really good, because it was a complex, um, unique, and new undertaking. It uh, had fixed resources and um, um, a timeline. And now we really um, want to, to have dynamic goals and decide ourselves what we spend our resources on. So um, therefore, we switch to the whole product management um, yeah, concept. And even though we are still way to go, it's working out um, fine so far for us. Um, we also um, adopted and experimented with a lot of agile methods. And I think this goes hand in hand with all this uh, cloud native yeah, movement, so to say. Um, most important method I want to highlight is this uh, Pivotal Dojo. So um, we not only sent application teams to London to Pivotal Labs, but also got some great engineers to Munich to our office and um, had a dojo, like a joint engagement over a couple of weeks where we worked together and um, yeah, experimented with all of those agile methods. Um, this is only an excerpt of what we actually are doing right now and experimenting with. Um, also to highlight pair programming and co-location. We really believe this is the way to go, um, not only in terms of uh, quality of what you're building, but also in terms of knowledge transfer and, uh, yeah, and I think fun and, and efficient work. Um, Reto's um, user interviews, you, you know all those uh, techniques, but we really did this for the like first time in, a, in an honest and, and serious way. So we went to our application developers, to their offices, which, which are on a different location and interviewed them, just listened for, for hours. And even if they complained, we just listened, wrote everything down, and we condensed the uh, results and uh, feed, it, feed it everything into our backlog or forwarded it to different people who were in charge. Um, also to highlight cross-functional teams, as Andrea said, uh, we try, uh, really try to, to bring everyone together. Um, IT security um, is really important. We really want to get the officers to be more, more of, of an engineer, basically to be there at the beginning of the process and develop together with us, not only saying yes or no at the end, yes or no, so this way. Um, yeah, and I could talk about um, all those methods all day long. Yeah. Um, also important, um, and this might seem very basic, but it's actually, um, we believe it's very, very important. Um, you have to have a beneficial working environment. Um, this is our new environment, and we are moving to this, this work, you know, this office in about six weeks, I, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about it, um, because um, this is following the approach 
of our Agile training centers, um, the new offices where all the application developers are located. We have nice bright furniture, we have pairing stations, we have uh, walls we can write on, uh, big screens we can put our Prometheus Grafana monitoring stuff on. Um, yeah, and we're really happy that we could convince um, the top management to build this office for the cloud team. Um, because, as you can imagine, this also costs money, um, but we really believe that this, this is like a, pre a prerequisite for, for pairing and, and have a well-functioning team, basically. Um, this slide is also very important, um, because with our new platform, uh, we basically implemented a new uh, working model. There is now a shared responsibility between the application developers and the uh, CloudOps team. As you can see here, this is like this layered stack, um, cloud ops, the 21 people are in charge of the virtual infrastructure, which we host at Amazon Web Services right now, our container platforms, and we have both Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, and we implemented both in 2016 at the same time, uh, and also the platform services around it, the additional services like monitoring, for example. We provide application-level monitoring as a service to our customers. Um, or CICD, we have a standardized pre-provisioned CICD pipeline for every team who's joining our platform. And to do all of this with 21 people for um, about 600 developers on the platform right now, um, the process have to scale. And um, so we really have to, to educate people not to route every ticket to us because we're not an ops unit. We are cloud ops and we are um, in charge of the, of the cloud platform and infrastructure, but not of your application. And this conversation uh, yeah, sometimes is kind of um, intense, um, but um, we are doing fine so far and uh, everyone is, is getting along. Um, also, last slide for the processes, uh, processes uh, chapter. We, of course, had to develop a lot of new operational processes about um, our platform. So, oh, this is, an, this is an old slide, actually, I updated it. But um, maybe to not confuse you, I'll just put it away. Um, uh, so basically, we, we um, implemented processes ar um, around the platform, like technical processes. Um, how do we want to do patching, scaling, updating, disaster recovery, backup, and all, all of that? We adapted our ITSM processes, which is very important because um, if you want to have CICD and everything, you cannot have uh, CAP meetings uh, every seven days and, and force everyone to wait for days to deploy. And also, we, um, yeah, we had to, to get the operational processes about the platform um, yeah, implemented like onboarding, offboarding, support processes for the application developers. And we implemented monitoring um, for all of, of those, and um, yeah, it's working fine so far. And the platform is actually really stable. Um, what we have to improve is the onboarding process, I'm honest, um, because this is uh, mainly uh, a manual process right now, but this was, um, or we put a lot of effort in, in building all those processes around it. So um, the technology chapter, to sum it up, is really short because um, we can see here, obviously, most important part is uh, uh, setting up Cloud Foundry or container uh, technologies. We set it up on Elastic Infrastructure. And I really just want to uh, say one sentence about this slide because it's important to us that this new platform is secure because it's a new platform, it's in the cloud. Um, so um, we really want to make sure it's, it's secure and there's a a talk about this um, I had last year. It's in German, unfortunately, so I don't know if, if you guys um, want to wanna check it out, but it's, it's, it's on YouTube, and if you want to know more about it, feel free to reach out to me after the talk. Last slide for my part. Um, modern technologies. Um, we see those technologies, and this is actually, um, yeah, quite the, the technologies we implemented in the last 18 months within Allianz. Um, you see there are technologies for container, uh, container technologies, cloud elastic infrastructure, CICD, monitoring, uh, API gateways, and what have you, even operating systems. Um, we brought everything in. We brought a lot of technologies in, but I think we found the balance between standardization and individual, individual solutions. And um, also to mention with those technologies, being just an enabler, we, um, we are following the 
rationals or best practices on the right side. Even if we're not perfect in it, we really try to do everything which you can see on the right side. So I hand it over to Andrea to sum it up. Okay. So with all of that, lessons learned and, and success factors, um, from a technology perspective, as Ludwig just said, uh, we're providing a platform for cloud native apps. Uh, we provide a standardized CI CD pipeline, fully automated, provide additional services, um, and um, we also follow those best practices, as we just heard. And um, the important piece here is that with technology, just like the processes and the, and the people um, puzzle, um, it's, we're not done. You know, we, we decided to just get started, do the best we can with the first iteration, and we continue to improve and automate and optimize. And every single person who's on that team now, that's what their main focus is, is to optimize and to automate um, and to make not only the technology but also the processes better. And our external um, folks that have been um, along with us on this journey were, of course, we, we had to bring in some expertise because with all this new technology and only um, a handful of people on the original team, we couldn't do it all uh, ourselves. But um, for this year, one of the main goals was to take that knowledge from, from the external folks and really make sure that the knowledge transfer happens within the first six months of, of this year um, so that the internal, the new team, are actually up and running uh, and can support and manage this platform uh, on their own. As far as the processes, yeah, we now um, are focused on product versus project management. Um, we introduce agile methods. We have um, assistance still with that, we need some coaching on that. Scrum master roles, product owner roles, all of that is new, especially given that we are operating within the larger organization and the people around us are also um, just beginning to learn. Um, Pivotal helped out with uh, different uh, projects, dojos, and um, you know, just the work environment um, is definitely something um, that, that's gonna make a difference once we can move into the new uh, workspace. And it's really also important uh, for every single one of the team members to be out there, to be positively promoting all of this, to be an evangelist, um, and to, uh, to always um, you know, create positive interactions with the other folks. As far as the people, new way of thinking, new way of working, new way of leadership, no blaming, there to make mistakes and, and learn from them. And then another really um, important piece, especially when it came to the recruiting, uh, I think it's a similar situation here in this country. Um, in Germany, it's been really challenging to find the right people um, because everybody's looking for them right now. Um, so what um, has been really helpful for us, first of all, to go through all the different channels, whether it be headhunters or whatever, but also to get the word out there, especially as, a, as an insurance company. You know, people who are into this kind of stuff probably don't think about insurance company. Um, that's not on the top of their list of cool places to go work, right? So to make sure that word um, gets out about what it is we're doing and how many cool things we're doing within the company has definitely helped um, to find uh, you know, a great mix of people, a very diverse um, team with different backgrounds, different skill sets. But uh, even though it's the ops team, which is where we started this journey, still have them focus on, on moving uh, toward more of a development uh, type mindset. And inside the company, we can't communicate enough. It always feels like, you know, we, we need to do more of that. But that's the case with, with any change and to just keep going uh, and to keep pushing it. And that's one of my favorite slides. So in order to be successful with this whole endeavor, um, in, in my experience, um, it is absolutely critical that you have the top-down support. Otherwise, you do nothing but try to create business case papers, right? So you need your top management support in this. You have to also get from the bottom up all of your folks on board, explain why you're doing it, why it's important, why it's actually really an awesome and fun endeavor. And it's not just an IT initiative. This really takes the entire organization. 
It takes the business, it takes IT, it takes HR, it takes everybody to work together on this transformation of your, of your business. And you really need a business vision um, that tells you where you're headed in terms of digital transformation to make this uh, journey successful, in our opinion. And that's, we're hiring. If any questions, you can open it up now. Thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. You know, what it really was in our, and we were really lucky, in our situation, they just let us do it. They provided the budget, and they just let us do it. They didn't say how to do it, they just said, just go do it. And, you know, obviously we communicated with them on a regular basis, um, and they were um, very um, present when we needed for them to be present. Um, and in terms of also communicating into the business or whatever. So it was really our CIO who was um, just um, the one who, who kicked this off and, and, uh, and, and enabled it uh, to happen and got you know, the support of his peers um, so that we could focus on what we needed to focus on, which is you know, get this platform up and running and the, and the team on board and, and everything you know, we just told you about. Yeah, you don't want them to, you know, too too close, but supporting. Yeah, ideally, yes. Yeah, but we had a bunch of other stuff going on at the same time, and and just had to juggle that. But that was certainly one of the main main priorities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, CIO Actually, we talked about that as an entire company. So what I mentioned at the very end, you know, to have a vision of, a business vision of what a customer-centric digital transformation could look like, we all actually worked on defining that together. Um, it went top down, bottom up, you know, and, and uh, we, we created, and, and then we were also given a, what we call a renewal agenda um, with different um, areas of focus uh, to ensure that everybody understood what the what the vision was and the strategy and and where we were headed. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to reach out if you have specific. Yeah. So if I heard you right, you're wondering if, if it was hard to get the buy-in from the developers to do the pair programming? So, you know, the, the first couple of teams that went to Pivotal, um, as far as I know, they volunteered. Mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. So they volunteered to go, and then when they came back, you know, they were so excited um, and, um, you know, that there were enough other people who wanted to participate and so those were the first ones to move into those training center spaces. Now it'll be interesting to see how the whole thing will scale up and expand. You know I know a few other companies uh, who, who have been uh, pursuing this um, for a um, longer time and there's certainly still a lot of work to do in that space particularly. Yeah. So thank you very much for, oh okay. I do a fair amount of mentoring to some of our younger developers at IBM. I mean, we do get, I think one of the things that helps personally, this is not so much a question as a comment, is, you know, we oftentimes get to the question of timing. It's usually you have know, these KPIs, you know, we're going to have fewer defects or a quicker time to resolve defects or quicker time to get features into production or ways of developing. But I, I, I think it's also useful to be really set the tone with, you know, developers like, What's the benefit to you other than management said do this? 
because otherwise, you know, at least in my experience, is you know that's just a recipe for people to skirt the process. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, the way, and I, I did this. Hey, we can do faster video doing pair programming, and I just come back with you. But what are the trade-offs? You know, where are you today? You know, what are the things that are blocking you as a development team? Is it you know you're waiting on code review? You know, like the only guys who are keeping code reviews. You know, and then you're having to go back and fix defects. And it, it, I I find it useful personally to kind of say, well, you know. Explain like here are the things that you're suffering from that you complain about today, and here's how this might affect that. Mm -hmm. Let's come back in you know a month or two after preparing and see how did this you know how is your experience because there has to be something in it for everybody. You can't be right. just about because management says so. yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So you know, for us, it was both of those things. One to have a few people who were really excited about it and came back and talked about it. But then you also, obviously, yeah, you have to continue to explain the why and, and uh, make sure that's clear, yeah. And what also definitely helps is to, to have pairing stations. <laughs> so um, all the teams who are on our platform are going to the ATC. They are pairing stations. They can choose wherever they want to sit, but there are two screens, two keyboards, two mice. Um, that helps. <laughs> So thank you all. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to talk to us um, afterwards. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.